Problem? No. No, no problem. It's just that... Just that what? A couple of very unimportant items seem to have eluded me, like who I am. You said you were a major. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Who are you? What are you doing here? Is there a circus around here somewhere? A circus? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there must be a circus. A clown, a circus, an officer, a war. That's logic, isn't it? But it doesn't figure at all. Not at all. Why not? Because there is no circus. And there is no war. You're just like the rest of us. The rest of us? You are now listening to that Twilighty show about that zone. I'm Nicole Phelps, and today we're going to discuss the third season episodes, Five Characters in Search of an Exit, and A Quality of Mercy. Stay tuned. These were the episodes, right? You did watch these? Yes. Okay, awesome. Because if I sent you, like, two different episodes, it would be a weird episode tonight. That's right. Then I'd be talking about very different things. <clears throat> right. Um, okay, so I figured the the way we go into, like, five characters in search of an exit is try, try having Rod pitch this idea to people, right? And they'd be like, you're completely out of your mind what is this what have you written here you have an interesting minimalist setup with these unusual people in costumes you have a ballerina an army major a bagpipe player a clown and a hobo is, mm -hmm. is that a hobo i guess it's a hobo right and you have <laughs> you have them in a situation where they are confined and they appear to be self-aware cognitive they're in full possession of their faculties and all they want to do is get out of this room they appear to be trapped in. 
One of them, the Major, manages to scale up the wall using his fellow prisoners as a makeshift ladder. Um, a bell rings, and he falls out into the snow, and then, no, <laughs> this is insane. What is wrong with Rod Serling here? <laughs> Mm. So this is how I imagine the back and forth memos went between Serling and CBS uh, networks back then were heavily invested in creative content, especially if a television show had marginal ratings. Um, that That's what I was assuming. I wrote this in November of last year, so I have no idea how you are. <laughs> you you have you have a baby. You have uh, uh, we call him Alistair around the apartment. Alistair. We say Alistair. It's like that. That's right. The, <laughs> our little British baby. The little he looked probably yeah. He actually, let me see. We still have we keep pictures of you guys on the fridge, and I'm looking at him right now, and he does look like John Luke Picard. He's very British. He's blonde-ish. He's, he looks like Julian Sands. <laughs> <laughs> With his little teeth. He was gonna be like Patrick Stewart. Now he's Julian Sand. Yeah. At some point. Uh, all right. So. Uh, at this moment I, I write this, I'm fighting with my stupid Wi-Fi connection. How about that? I wrote that in my notes. <laughs> I think I also had a mini anxiety attack. I've been trying to quit smoking, so I took up vaping. I mention this because the Army Major, played by <laughs> William Wyndham, looks like he could use a freaking cigarette throughout this entire episode. Everybody smokes on the Twilight Zone anyway. So he's the last person who materializes into this, for lack of a better word, cage. And he's also the only person to come up with any ideas about escaping uh, so what, what what do you think of this episode oh well i guess like when i started watching it i was like oh what is going on and immediately i thought of john paul sartre's no exit right um and i was like oh my god you know that that scenario which you know i did that play in high school in our little black box theater so, so you know imagine a bunch of little teen year olds doing no exit Right. Um, and I was Inez, right? Inez, yeah. Sort of the... Inez, yeah. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so that's what I thought. I was like, oh, that's that's sort of the setup. And I'm, I'm that's my fantasy is like there's there was inspiration around that. Because then he says, like, this must be hell. <laughs> so can you, can you just fill us in a little bit on the story of Sartre's No Exit? Yeah, so essentially it's like, let's see, I guess it's... Our son is the man, and then there's Inez, and there's a can't remember the character's name off the top of my head right now. They're in um, their room, like they're shown in this room to this room, and like their interactions are um, and their interactions with each other are what is making hell hell for them. So. Um, so it's like there's a lot of, do you know the term triangulation, like where two of them sort of like align with each other and sort of peck the other person and then they realign and then the other two sort of get into alignment. So it's like the situation where you have like people in a room and they're forming alliances, then breaking those alliances and then forming other ones. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that, that's what I was expecting you know, sort of more of, but, you know, you're in a, t what, 20 minute story. So it's like, how is that going to, how is it going to play out, you know, right. in that, that quick of, of a story? So, so it's Estelle, Joseph, and Inez. And are these like archetypes, like the ballerina and the hobo and the clown and all that? Very much, yeah. They're definitely the, the archetypal sort of characters. So it sort of it comes together with a major coming in there because he is he is uh, the obvious authority figure here because his idea is escaping and he wants everybody to get like together and mm -hmm. and help to get out of this situation. No one else is in that position. Everybody else yeah. seems content with their imprisonment. Does it seem that way to you? Yeah, very much so. And and even the is sort of like I thought the clown was going to be even more of a barrier for him because you know he he's definitely the the one that's most like look we've tried all this it's been done like sit down and shut up yeah you he's know? yeah the like, clown is very much a pain in the ass in this whole episode mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah <laughs> especially like, with all of his crazy you know I don't know what he's doing most of the time no he's like some weird 
he he's like a weird British queer or something. Yeah, he's <laughs> since we're using strange, the word queer yeah. so much. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and he's got like a yeah, potted I, plant for a hat. It's weird. Yeah, yeah. He's just sort of yeah, and just very sort of um, mocking with the the um, the major, right? He's the yeah. major. Yeah. yeah. So he's pretty he's much making very... fun of the major. Yeah. Yeah, he's just kind of antagonizing him and just kind of what I saw as like, our, you know, the culture is set, we've set our norms, and that's sort of like that big picture of our culture. Like things are what they are, and if somebody comes in and tries to change them, we're going to stand up against Interesting, you. yeah. I don't think, I don't, I don't, I don't think <laughs> I really thought of it that way. It's it, it, yeah. This is obviously meant to be pretty deep, but we're, it's so bizarre that the mm. deepness kind of goes over your head. Yeah. Maybe we're all insane, or maybe this is a mirage, an illusion. We're dead. And this is limbo. We don't really exist. We're dream figures from somebody else's existence. Oh, we're each of us having a dream. And everyone else is part of the other person's dream. You call it. You can have it. That's the one thing we have an abundance of. Possibilities. An infinite number of possibilities. How about getting out of here? Anybody examine that possibility? Of you, Major. We're trapped down here. There's no way out, man. This is a nightmare. It must be a nightmare. It is indeed. But whose? Yours? Mine? The Scotsman? The ballet dancer? Just whose nightmare is it? Someone knows we're here. How so? They have to. You've all been here a while, possibly a long while. Someone must feed you. Someone must give you water. Well, someone must bring food down. There's been no food or water. But we'll starve to death or we'll die of thirst. Do you feel hungry, Major, or thirsty, or heat, or cold, or fatigue, or discomfort? Or anything? Do you feel anything, Major? So you got, what is it, uh, they, they have no indication of where they are, except for these intermittent bells that keep ringing, <laughs> to keep yeah, driving them and nuts. and knocking them down. To yeah, the yeah, ground. every time they try to do something, these damn bells pop up, you know, bing, yes. bing, um... The hobo and the bagpipe player are passive. The clown antagonizes him, like you said. The ballerina, what does she do? How does the ballerina serve the story here? Well, the ballerina is just sort of that female figure. Like, she's like, like there. she vacillates between sort of like the innocent, you know, like, oh, um, you know, um, everything's going to be okay. And like, was consoling him, like, when he started getting really upset. She's like, it's okay, everything's going to be okay. She's like the good and cop. She's the good yeah, cop. She's yeah, like... the good cop are, like, that, just that female archetype of caregiver, you know, where she's, like, caregiving. But then there's also even, like, the way she they have her posing at him, too. It's like she's on the ground and <coughs> reaching up to him. And yeah. um, so she, yeah, like, I feel like she's just sort of, like, the token girl. Plus, she, I guess maybe she also gives the major a reason to fight, right? Right, yeah. You fight like for she, your women. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter what the ultimate outcome is. Mm -hmm. uh, you're just sort of, you're fighting for a woman and fighting other guys for the woman or something like that. I mean, maybe it's a male-female uh, stereotype. Yeah, yeah. Like, maybe she's sort of the impetus, like, to give him that, like, extra jolt of, like, no, we're going to get out of here. And she sort of represents that, but also definitely like the caregiver, like it's okay. You know, she was consoling him and like when he's really getting frustrated, she's like, it's okay. And... She even does it at the end. It's weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the major comes up with the idea to use his ceremonial sword as a grappling hook and then to use the characters as stepping stones up a human ladder. He gets to the top. He can feel the air. He makes it to the rim, and then the bell rings again. He screams and falls into a bed of snow where it's revealed he's actually a doll or an mm -hmm. action figure, something of that ilk. This is the jar of forgotten toys. They're all dolls, the ballerina, the hobo, the clown, the bagpipe player. And then a little girl picks up the doll, 
gives it back to the woman on the street corner. She's collecting toys for needy children. These mm-hmm. dolls seem more like Christmas decorations than actual dolls. Plus, they're out of their original packaging, which means, of course, they're essentially worthless. So yeah. we donate toys, too, but we usually purchase them specifically for donation. I remember once I bought a – what did I buy? I bought a magical eight ball. Remember those? Yes, I love Magic eight ball. And tossed it into the bin. <laughs> and I kept it in its original packaging. At least somebody could eBay it later on and make millions, you know. There you <laughs> but, go. <laughs> What did you uh, What did you think of this episode? I I enjoyed it. It's you know it's sort of like I kept sort of waiting as I watched it for what the device was going to be like what was going to be on the other side. Um, so you okay? So you were like sitting on your couch and you're like, they're all aliens from another planet. No, they're all family members. No, they're related to each other. No, they're all dead. What is it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> like I was like, wait, are they all dead? Like, yeah. are they part of a science? This is like an M Night movie you know, or something. Shyamalan, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's complete. What I love, yeah, but I, I did enjoy it. It's very similar to an episode that we talked about before, which is the After Hours. Remember that with Anne Francis as yes. a mannequin? Yes. It, it, because it has no like outward logic. It makes no sense, you know. I mean, it's like the, yeah. the, only the, the only the characters have internal logic, but we are we are completely in the dark about what's going on here. Yeah, you're just sort of waiting. Yeah, so I thought that that was that was sort of interesting, and I also enjoy sort of watching the um, archetypal characters representing different ourselves, or you know, because he even makes reference to that. Like, we, are we all? Like they each kind of go by through their own hypothesis of what's happening, and one of them says, "Like we're all just parts of one person." Um, you mean like Jungian? It's weird, like a Jungian yes, kind exactly. of personality. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I I enjoy it. Like I enjoy that because it is psychological. It's a psychological theme, and I I enjoyed so that. Have you? Uh... I know we talked about this before, but have you managed to get Guinevere to watch with you? No, but but every time I watch them, she has me recount them to her. Because I think they kind of freak her out. Yeah, I, I would. <laughs> like, watching them, but then, like, if I tell them to her, there's something more palatable about that for her. And she, like, loves the stories. I mean, I even told you it inspired her, one of her school projects. Right. Um, I am actually going to have uh, Regan watch episodes with me and do an episode this for this season. Oh, that's so fantastic. That will actually happen, finally. I can't wait. I just hope that she has enough patience to deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she's 10 she for crying out loud. It's like, that, why is everything in black and white? What is this? <laughs> no, something like that. <laughs> yeah, why? Are, this is boring. Black and white. Just to wrap this one up, Lamont Johnson directs the episode from Rod Serling's script based on the story of The Depository by Marvin Petal. Uh, excellent direction considering the one location. I really liked it. I liked it a lot. The performances were great. And like I said, it's bizarre. You you had this you you, you had this idea that the, the ballerina is there to comfort the major and the final <laughs> shot shows the doll of the ballerina's hand coming down and touching the doll of the major. And it's a great mm. moment. All right, moving on to the next episode. Okay. Now, I find as I grow older, I have less patience for social commentary in movies and television. It it doesn't hit you as hard reading a book or a short story. For example, mm. I'm going to say a handful of episodes of Twilight Zone where you can tell they're laying in on thick, Sterling in particular. He loves to whip up a little message for the folks. Some, so sometimes he'll throw caution to the winds and give us nonsense like the After Hours or our previous episode that we were talking about. Sometimes he'll get preachy with the monsters are due on Maple Street, the obsolete man, the the shelter, or this little gem, a quality of mercy. I sound like the Crypt Keeper, don't I? <laughs> you remember yeah. the Crypt Keeper from Tales from the Crypt? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd like to call this one a quality of mercy. <laughs> you know. So, taken from a line in The Merchant of Venice... Something about a quality of mercy. Blah, blah, blah. No, it's, uh, well, I'll, t- I'll, I'll give you the line at the end of the episode. Um, this episode premiered four days after Christmas in 1961. A little Christmas treat. A little lump of coal in our stocking. We have Dean Stockwell, a young, ambitious lieutenant assigned to war-weary platoon, including 
pre-Star Trek Leonard Nimoy as a communications officer. Did you did you notice him? Yes. And he had no ears. He didn't. Well, I mean, he had ears. He just didn't have the Vulcan ears. This yes. Time. And all right, so we have this platoon. It's led by Albert Salmi, who you might remember from the episode with with the Professor uh, Execution, where he plays a violent cowboy who gets time warped into modern times and shoots a jukebox. Yes. He's excellent here. He's angry and he's tired and he wants to go home. That's the whole <laughs> message of the thing. Stockwell is a god of war. He wants to destroy everything that is enemy. He even has the nerve to lecture Salmi about the subject. His, his words come back later to haunt him. And it's near the end of the war and Stockwell wants to like barrage a nearby cave where Japanese soldiers are hiding. Supplies haven't gotten through. So it's like the, the Japanese soldiers are sick and dying. And there's no point to this, uh, but Stockwell is young and stupid. I'm not your cup of tea, am I, Sergeant? Well, you got a little bit too much vinegar for me, Lieutenant. Look, we could bypass them. There aren't 20 Japs in there, and they're sick and half starved. But they're Japs. They're men, Lieutenant. You've got a funny group here, Sergeant, and you're the oddball of the bunch. If you'll forgive me an observation, if I had to size you up, I'd say you've either got battle fatigue or you're chicken. Well, maybe neither, and maybe a little bit of both. I don't know, but the way I size you... Go ahead, Sergeant. How do you size me up? All right. You're a pea-green shaved tail just fresh from some campus. I'm afraid you won't bag your limit. Or worse, all shook up because somebody might spot you as a Johnny come lately instead of a killer of men. Think that ought to do it? No. Uh, you ask me, Lieutenant. You're going to get it. You want to prove your manhood, but it's a little late in the day. And there aren't many choices left as to how to do it. It all boils down to that lousy cave full of sick, pitiful, half-dead losers and a platoon of dirty, tired men that have their craw full of this war. You're a lousy soldier, Cosarano. And that goes for the rest of these poor, sad, sensitive, sick boys you want me to bottle feed. Did somebody forget to tell you when you fight a war, you fight a war? And you kill until you're ordered to stop killing. All right, I got your message, Lieutenant. And as they prepare, he breaks his binoculars and then becomes the visual trigger for what will occur. Mm -hmm. He transforms into a young Japanese soldier on the other side. So this change apparently affects his disposition as well as his physical appearance. Although this was when filmmakers thought they could make actors look Asian with a little spirit gum and affectation in their speech. Mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I don't think Stockwell pulls it off. Did they... Do you think they cast him because they thought he could pass for Asian? I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I I, I found that really interesting, too. I was like, huh. Because um, he even, like, had it, like, he was doing sort of an accent type of a thing. But it was kind of subtle. Yeah, he's like, well, he he, he talked like this. He talked like that, you know. Yeah, yeah that was just not very PC. No, it's not. But, you know, for me, it gets the message across. I don't really care if it doesn't look right. I care more that the message comes across. Yes. And yes. it's very and strong. I, yes. You have a white guy, they've made him Asian, and he has to act Asian now. And I think, mm. you know, yeah, nowadays they would rip it apart. They would call it racist for, for doing that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really effective. Stockwell runs the same number on his superior that they're all tired. He shows humanity. He doesn't want to fight. And his mm -hmm. superior officer gives him his own spiel about how they have to kill. Kill, kill, kill. That's his whole mm -hmm. thing. The Japanese army does not bypass. The Japanese army attack. The Japanese army wipes out its opponents. But they're wounded. They're wounded and beaten. Lieutenant Yamuri, odd that you should require this reminder. But the comparative health and well-being of the enemy his comfort or his discomfort, the degree of his anguish or his incapacities have no more bearing on a military action, a tactical move, or a decision of command than the fortunes of an anthill that you step on when we move out to attack. They are the enemy. They are American. If when we enter the cave and they are lying on the ground, I can assure you I will have no more compunction about making them a head shorter than I would stepping on that anthill. But they are men. They are enemy, and this is war, and in war you kill. You kill, Lieutenant. You kill until you are ordered to stop killing. 
You kill until you are ordered to stop killing. No. He mm-hmm. breaks his binoculars. He goes back to the other side, perhaps wiser. Luckily, the war has just ended, and off we go. So, despite all the moralizing, I like the idea that our enemies have the same worries, the same fears and concerns that we have. What did you think of this episode? I found it really interesting because the the ending, he had like big person shoes and had sort of been on the other side, had sort of this like shock empathy. It was very bittersweet because they talk about dropping the bomb, the after effects and the horrors that occurred because of the atomic bomb, I think are, you know, so it was like, yeah, you know, there's all this sort of like whooping, like, woo, you know, we're so excited. The war is over. We're leaving. But on the other hand, I was like, oh, but, you know, what, how it ended and, and what, they did to end that war was, you know, atrocious, you know, as an atrocity. Right. So it was super bittersweet. It also sort of reminded me of, do you know Dr. Seuss, the better butter battle? No, I don't. Can you Oh my God, tell us a you need to, it? you need to read this book. Um, so essentially what it is, is a Dr. Seuss story and it is about these people who eat their bread their bread and butter one of them one side butters the top side and the other side butters the the downside okay and they're they're always in war with each other <clears throat> so each side is always trying to outdo the other side with like these machines, which essentially are like weapons. Okay. And they keep getting like bigger and badder on each side, you know, so one side lobs something over that side, you know, builds a bigger machine, lobs something else over the other side gets angry. They build a bigger machine, but by the end of it, Each of them have a tiny little rock, the size of a rock, and it's talking, everybody goes underground. So it's very much that sort of like nuclear war. um, Yeah, there's definitely like an analogy. Yeah, the analogy of it. What it it sounds like is you have two societies that go completely out of their mind because of toast. Yes. (laughs) We need to eliminate toast, obviously. This is the... the This is the message. (laughs) No more toast. It only makes us crazy. (laughs) And no more, yeah, no more butter. Um, Well, I, you know, this is very preachy for me, this episode. It's very preachy. Mm -hmm. You know, I get it. We're all the same. It's only our ideology, our cult, our religion that separates us. We live by a paradoxical doctrine that preaches the dogma of individuality, but we have a, a herd instinct. Or, or that makes us want to kill our enemies, or whom the, our government perceives as enemies. Right. So it's all nonsense. It, it might as well. We might as well be fighting over toast. Yeah. Okay. I, yes, exactly. So according to a couple of different sources, this episode served as the inspiration for the opening segment of Twilight Zone the movie, the episode Time Out, which is not coincidentally the name of this episode that we're doing. Uh, written and directed by John Landis, starring the late Vic Morrow. I, I don't know that I consider it a remake. It's more of a variation on the theme. You have an incredible performance from Vic Morrow. He's like every other guy you know. He got passed over for a job. He's racist. He has money problems. He's turned into a he's turned into a Jew in wartime France. He's a Viet Cong. He becomes a black man in the South. And it's just a variation on the story. Hmm. Um, so do you think... Uh, d- d- is this too much? Do you think this... this this episode is just too much as far as the getting the message across. I do in the sense that I didn't, like I said, like I didn't like the bittersweetness of the ending. Like I feel like, um, using an actual war that actually happened and a group of people that were actually affected I didn't like that, you know, because at the end of the day, it was like, yay, the war's over. Everything's fine. And it's like, wow, yeah, the Americans, 
you know, got to turn off their TV and forget about it. Whereas, you know, in Japan, you know, they're still suffering from the after effects of, of what happened in the U S and there. So yeah, I, I wasn't a big fan. I, I enjoyed the message of empathy for other people. And I enjoyed that. Um, we also have to remember that the Japanese had to deal with Godzilla as well. Well, so. there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because of our dropping bombs, we created Godzilla. Get it? <laughs> exactly. Really dangerous. Wait, what monster. was your, you had a final point there? I'm sorry um, before I interrupted oh, no. you. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Um, yeah. So I think that um, I like the, the idea of, of empathy and gaining ep- empathy. I didn't like the way the episode did it. All right. I got to agree with you. Uh, thanks so much for being a part of this. I'm really sorry for all the technical difficulties we had. I don't know what's going on with this thing, this computer. <laughs> uh, this has been That Twilighty Show About That Zone. I want to thank my guest for this episode, the great Nicole Phelps. Next Yay! time, I will be discussing Nothing in the Dark and One More Pallbearer with Eve Kerrigan. Kids, spirit gum doesn't make you Asian. Just ask Mickey Rooney or Peter Ustinov or Warner Oland or Christopher Reeve. Christopher Lee, sorry. <laughs> Christopher Reeve was never Asian, sorry. No. <laughs> he was Superman. <laughs> That's right. Was, uh, I meant to say Christopher Lee. Uh, or Peter Sellers, as uh, Harry Who would say, amazing. Uh, and... Julia Seashell Eyes Windy Smile Calls Me So I Sing of Love uh, So I Sing of Song of Love Julia Goodnight Blah. That was terrible Wasn't it? <laughs> that was just like no. the worst <laughs> I tried ah. to keep a little bit of poetry at the, uh, Put a little bit of poetry at the end of these episodes So I used a line from a Beatles song It was terrible That was. Just... You didn't like it? Well my, my I'm sorry my read of it was terrible <laughs> I'm not oh, well, I, I didn't hear it well you didn't I, even I mean, hear it, so it doesn't even matter. <laughs> no. It's okay. Um, anyway, thanks. Good night. Thank you. Yeah, we'll talk soon. <laughs> we'll talk soon. We'll talk soon. <laughs>